Welcome back to this week's segment of Myths versus Facts. We are going to talk about the weeks leading up to the inauguration and the beginning of the Civil War. We've decided to confine this week's segment to basically giving you a sense of the influences, the attitude, the paranoia leading to the actions of Abraham Lincoln upon his inauguration. Otherwise, we would take half a year to break, the, break these weeks down. We heartily recommend that you read all about it in my book. From the day that Lincoln left his home to go to Washington to the day he was inaugurated, he was surrounded by the minions of the conspiracy. From Alan Pinkerton, who guarded Lincoln on his journey, to the German socialist Turner Militia, who guarded Lincoln at the inauguration. Lincoln had a lot to answer for as to his actions, but woven within them was the sort of influence that came from such men as Alan Pinkerton. Alan Pinkerton, the man who formed the secret society within the wide awake Republicans, was born in Scotland. And even though his father was a policeman, he was injured in a Chartist riot. Pinkerton became an ardent Chartist by age 19, plotting and rioting. He had founded the Glasgow Democratic Club and British authorities started to arrest these activists, so he left England. The Chartist newspaper, The Red Republican, printed the Communist Manifesto after Pinkerton left Great Britain. Now the manifesto was written after Pinkerton came to the United States, but even so, this gives you an idea where the Chartists were coming from. In America, Pinkerton became an active associate of the terrorist John Brown, not simply a supporter. He personally worked with him, and Brown even stayed in Pinkerton's home on occasion. Pinkerton established a tech detective agency and adopted the logo of the Eye of Horus, or the so-called Seeing Eye, and the motto, We Never Sleep, since the eye never closed. The logo led to the moniker Private Eye, meaning a detective, a nickname used so often in the early 20th century detective stories, magazines, and movies. Pinkerton disobeyed the law in Great Britain, helped a terrorist break the law in America, formed a detective agency, became the main intelligence officer of the Union at the beginning of the Civil War, and helped lay the groundwork for the U.S. Secret Service. The deep state is much older than people realize, or realize whence it was formed. Pinkerton played a major part in the psychological basis for the events that triggered the start of the war. The agitation over the election was high, since Lincoln was elected by the smallest percentage of the popular vote of any president. The people were not happy about it. The political tension was high and the editorial attacks against the newly elected president were vituperative. Similar attacks today would more than likely draw the attention of Homeland Security. Pinkerton told Lincoln that there was an assassination plot against him to take place on his journey to Washington. This led to Lincoln disguising himself and switching trains. Many of those around Lincoln at the time said that there was no evidence that such a plot existed except in the mind of Pinkerton. Ward Hill Lamon, Lincoln's bodyguard, discredited Pinkerton's claim of a, Bel of, of a Baltimore assassination plot. Now, true or not, the debate goes on even today and the whole situation bred a considerable amount of paranoia in the pres presidential party and set the mood for the first week of the administration since he was guarded constantly. This state of agitation played on Lincoln's mind as well as those who believed the story of a plot against Lincoln's life. Now, whether it was true or not, it had the same effect. This produced a them and us attitude where Lincoln was prevented from taking the advice of some people because they were not allowed to get near him, or he weighed advice based on this frame of mind. Considering, a, a considering this, it's, in, it's interesting that while Lincoln's first inaugural was heavily guarded due to these seeming threats to his life, his second inaugural was not heavily guarded when the plot to kill him was definitely real. The first inauguration was guarded by the local Turnist, uh, socialist Turner units. On the other hand, a photograph of the second inauguration shows John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's assassination, uh, uh, and uh, assassinator, and some of his fellow conspirators standing within a few feet of an unprotected Lincoln 
at the inaugural podium in the middle of the war. Incidentally, the first inaugural procession included Edward Dickinson Baker in the carriage with Lincoln, a man rarely mentioned in histories about Lincoln. Lincoln named his son Edward Baker Lincoln after him. Baker's family had immigrated to the United States and moved immediately to live at the communist commune called New Harmony in 1825. After a year, they left and settled in Illinois. This was the family background of Baker, which started its American venture, adventure in a communist commune. Baker went on to become a U.S. senator and was killed during the war. An interesting fellow for Lincoln to have in his carriage with him as inauguration. But then, we've identified several interesting friends of Lincoln in our book. At the beginning of the war, Pinkerton was put in charge of Army intelligence, and the man he directly reported to was Colonel Thomas Key, who served under General McClellan. Key was a law partner of Alfonso Taft, the co-founder of Skull and Bones. Key was also a member of this order. Think of it. The two primary men in charge of United States intelligence were a chartist and a member of the order. Is it any wonder they had the problems they had in those days? Now, you can't make this stuff up. And seriously, at the top, not much has changed in our intelligence community today. But that is a different story. Well, not really. It's a continuation of the same story. And that is one of the points of this whole exercise, to demonstrate that this has been going on a very long time. The decisions of Lincoln and General McClellan, commander of the Army of the Potomac, were affected by the intelligence operations of Pinkerton and Key. Thus, the timetable of combat operations was seriously affected and helped make sure that a real war would get started rather than ending rather quickly by making the Federal Army hesitate to move forward at a time when the Confederate Army was virtually non-existent. Pinkerton always gave Confederate troop numbers that were two to three times over the real number which slowed the Federal Army from moving forward when it had the advantage, but were lied to about Confederate strength. If the Federal Army had moved immediately, the war would have been over very soon. The conspiracy needed a long, drawn-out war in order to change American society. Next week, Making War Inevitable, 